which all they do is give security clearances and collect information. Uh, why am I bringing this up? Because it was hacked. Yeah, every single document was stolen in from the years 2013 to 2015 from the Office of Personnel Management. So they knew who are in CIA now? That's exactly the thing. If they literally have, so the CIA did not keep their stuff on the Office of Personnel Management because they didn't trust it, but a lot of people who were applying to join the CIA, their stuff was taken. Everybody, 22.5 million Americans, all of whom work for or have applied to work for the government, had 157 pages worth of information stolen and siphoned off into China. Now. That's a lot of information. Alone, that's not all that useful. Like, okay, you've got 22.5 million people's worth of stuff, but what can you do with it? Think back to privacy. Um, you could probably start with data mining. Yeah, you, this is a giant database that is now perfect for data mining. You want to know what sorts of, so say you've got this list, and you want to know what an American spy looks like. You want to know what sort of criteria you can find based on this Office of Personnel Management, what it looks like, what sorts of... Because if you're going to send somebody to another country to be a secret agent or to work undercover, you give them a fake story. You say that they worked here for a while, you worked there for a while. And if you're constructing a fake persona for all these different people, their fake personas are going to have certain things in common. So if you data mine and you see, oh, this person is a s secret agent. Oh, this person has a fake working from this year to this year for this company? Oh, that's a good sign that that's what their job description is. They are collecting information about China illegally for the purpose of espionage. So let's take all that information and use it to find more spies. Or say, um, what's the most valuable sort of thing if you're a spy agency? Where's the best place to have one of your own spies working? If I want, if I'm the head of the CIA, and I want to get as much information about China as possible, specifically everything like secretive, super hidden. Where do I want somebody working? Inside their version of the CIA. So what's the best way to turn someone and get them on your side? Money. Money, blackmail, anything that you can use against them. What's a really useful thing to know who's likely to turn? Background check. Background check. You find out somebody's a hundred thousand dollars in debt, that's a pretty good person to try turning. Or you know this person's child is somewhere, you can contact them with that information. This is the sort of stuff which 22.5 million Americans, 157 page documents of their entire life is useful for. Also combine that with other things like health insurance, doctor's information get excitement off, and you've suddenly got an entire map that you can do that with. And that's what you can do with this sort of information. And this is a case in which this was a company who, or this was a country hacking another country in classic espionage, but also it was tied in with crime and cybercrime and hacking of Google and things like that. So this is the sort of thing where the line between espionage, diplomacy, and crime is very different. Also, if you now know that, like, you have a list of all the people who could be a secret agent getting assigned to China in the near future, and you now know exactly who they are, what can you now do? As soon as they show up in China, what are you gonna do? Arrest them, Arrest them because that's espionage, it's illegal. So any other nation is go who s tries to send those people is gonna be shut down and prevented from doing so before they even hit the ground. That's gonna cripple an opponent's uh, um, secret service or secret agent slash espionage organizations, which gives you an advantage in diplomacy. So this is how it's all tied together. Now, uh, everyone on board with this crazy sort of, sort of stuff. Now, why on earth is Seth Rogen on here? The interview. The interview. What was the interview? <coughs> what is the interview? The yeah. So Seth Rogen is that actor who was in like all the. What was it? He was first in Freaks and Geeks, and then he was in like uh, a whole bunch of Stone movies. Yeah, he was in all those Judd Apatow movies. Uh, let's just. Yeah. No, but there is a movie called The Interview. Yes, and that's exactly. This is what Seth Rogen looks like. 
This is Seth Rogen, for those of you who don't know. Oh, yeah. This actor. Okay. So why is he up here? Because of the interview. What was the interview? It was a movie. Kim Jong Un. So who? It was a movie about Seth Rogen and James Franco are two bumbling incompetent reporters. Dave Garlark and Aaron Rappaport. Yes, those are their character names. They are sent to, they get an interview with Kim Jong-un. Who's Kim Jong-un? North Korea, Supreme Leader of North Korea. So North Korean leader. In the movie, what is the plot of the movie? Yes, their job is to go there and in the process of this interview, kill Kim Jong-un. This was the entire movie. I have not seen it, I've heard it's perfectly mediocre. Uh, why on earth is it up here? Who didn't like this movie? Yeah, Kim Jong-un really didn't like the idea that there was a movie about killing him. So what did he do? He had the Sony. So he first sent Sony and the United States a very strongly worded letter that said, pull this. Uh, can the U.S. government tell a private company to pull a movie? No. No, why not? Private company. And what protects them? The FBI. No. no. <laughs> First Amendment. You are not allowed to stop freedom of speech. Yeah. You aren't allowed to pull a work of art, whether movies count under that category, uh, even if it's about <laughs> killing the North Korean leader. So Kim Jong-un was not happy about this. So he said, pull this movie. The US government said, yes, Kim Jong-un. Every time anything the United States does makes Kim Jong-un unhappy, he threatens us and yada yada. So they're just like, okay, whatever. And Sony was like, should we do anything about this? And the government was like, they're always complaining. Don't worry about it. What actually happened? <laughs> they were hacked. They were hacked. It, basically, North Korean hackers, in response, when the movie wasn't pulled, hacked into Sony and shut down Sony. They had to basically, any computer that wasn't literally pulled out of the wall went black. For months, they had to pay, pay people in checks because their computer system wasn't up and running. It ended up costing them like half a billion dollars. Uh, the movie was still in processing, but it was all shut down. And eventually, what happened after this, after it was hacked, all of this stuff happened, what did Kim Jong-un then say when, they, when Sony said the movie's still going to get it? Released. Yeah, he said if this movie gets released, Americans will die. This is the dictator of North Korea attacking a movie written by Seth Rogen in order to, because he didn't like the message about it. And then, as soon as this attack happened, and then this death threat was made, what did Sony do? Anyone know what Sony's response after the threats were made? Did the movie ever make it to theaters? No. It didn't make it to big theaters. It went straight to YouTube. It was, it went to independent theaters, but like Regal, United, Sony decided to pull the movie for fear of threats. What is the significance of this? Why are we talking about this? How is this such a big deal? Why is it a big deal? So he's using computers. Here's a case in which this is diplomacy. Kim Jong-un didn't like that the United States was making a movie, the main plot of which was him dying. He then attacked a foreign, a private company, so much so that the private company then pulled it. Therefore, it's basically this man decided, you know what, I don't care about your First Amendment. I wanted that movie gone, and I will attack your country and make you fear your well-being enough that you pull the movie. Like, pause for a second. That's extraordinary. The reason that movie didn't get played is because the head of North Korea didn't want it released. That's all it comes down to. He didn't want it released, and he had the power through cyber technology to shut down the company and make them credibly worried for the well-being of people seeing that movie. But just pause for a second. That is a dictator deciding what is on your screen. You could not see that movie, and that company did not publish it for the simple reason of Kim Jong-un didn't like it. <laughs> that is an, ex like just pause and let that, that is an extraordinary thing. 
We are a country built on the idea of freedom of speech and freedom of ideas and freedom of uh, religion. And now it's not that our president told us we couldn't do it and it had a trickle down effect. Somebody halfway around the world did. And all of it's possible because you can hack from halfway around the world. Crazy world. Yeah, this is, this is a case in which, also here's another thing, when they did this sort of thing, it literally shut down computer systems in Sony headquarters. Yeah. And like, things exploded. Like, very small scale when things are put out of line. But it was basically, imagine what the equivalent would have been if a, Kim Jong-un had called together 10 of his closest people and said, all right, you've got a job. Sneak into America and break everything in Sony headquarters with a hammer. <laughs> what would we have called that? Vandalism? Vandalism? What if they had done it, what if they just walked into Sony headquarters wearing their full North Korean army outfits and shot up the place? Terrorism. What would we call that? Terrorism. Terrorism. What if a North Korean plane flew over, dropped a bomb? We call it a war. Say they bombed at night when no employees were there, nobody died. All that happened when Sony headquarters were in, in the US were blown up. That sounds a lot like a war. But, and yet that's what Kim Jong-un did from halfway around the world using cyber technology. That is the, he shut down something and controlled it using nothing but technology. Going back to Stuxnet, think about what it would have taken to shut that down. It would have taken a war to shut that down 50 years ago. And now it's not even that it didn't, we were able to do it from halfway around the world. It's still the case that no one has fully committed and proved and said, yeah, we did Stuxnet, that was us. No one, it's still plausible deniability. This is a fundamentally different world that we're living in. And just like, think about that. Like, the, the game has changed. All right, the last one. Does anyone know who Karasimov is? Um, I can clarify a little, uh, a little reading before the uh, people are on class. So it's uh, the Notre Doctrine that based on the anti-color revolution doctrine, that is uh, something uh, like we would refer to the Arabic Spring or Ukrainian Euro Maidan, uh, that is supposed to unite all kinds of souls, poor souls, uh, on a state and public. Uh, uh, so every kind of assault, including cyber crimes, um, are supposed to be uh, will be designated as an assault against the country and the state. Yeah. So the so the background is Gerasimov is a man who's high up in Putin's military hierarchy. He's a, yeah, within the Russian military hierarchy. He, a few years ago, published this truly incredible short little article in like a military journal, which was basically something along the lines of, if you think war is anything like it used to be, it isn't anymore. And the very idea that you would ever put troops on the ground and that's your main method, that's out the window. And if you wanna know what a war is gonna look like, this is what it's going to look like. And then he laid out all the different things that go together. And his, what he envisioned was a war in which it was constant bombardment from low-level military with plausible deniability. It was constant cyber attacks. It was propaganda being piped in through social media to affect and open up divides between different places. And so it included things, and this is where this is going to come in. Um, let me pull up exactly what I have here with Gerasimov because it's it's really a fascinating uh, article because it's basically saying the game is just so much different than it was before. So, for instance, um, when when it used to be the case that you'd go to war, you would send troops on the ground and you would first declare we're at war. And then you'd send a bunch of people in nice, colorful uniforms, and you'd be able to go, that's a soldier, that's not a soldier, we shoot that one. So what way to make sure that that doesn't, like, why would you do that anymore? Well, you don't. Instead, you send a bunch of people with, dressed in regular clothes who happen to have guns, and you say, all right, cross the border and do what we want you to do. And then at the same time, what you do is you start trying to undermine the institutions of that nation, and you start trying to affect their uh, infrastructure. So for instance, um, if you were to invade a nation 
these days, you wouldn't do it in the straightforward way. What's the first thing that would be done in any sort of attack in a, like, a large-scale war these days? Probably like, limit their resources. Limit their resources. Specifically, think back to the beginning of class. What's the first thing you'd do? Beginning of class, what did we watch a video of? Oh, the power plant. Yeah, you shut down the, you shut down the power grid. And you know how easy that would be right now? I read a thing today about how um, in the past few months, the US has really been stepping up the amount of cyber, uh, the amount of malware we have in the Russian power grid. And the Russians, we already have evidence, have a lot of stuff in our power grid. And China has a lot of stuff in ours, and we have a lot in theirs, and Russia has a lot. Every nation in the world has the ability these days to shut off the lights on every other nation. But no one's going to do it because, you know, they're going to do it back to you. So why on earth would you do it unless it's a sort of mutually assured power destruction? So why on earth would you try to do that? Well, you wouldn't. Instead, you're going to try to get the... Because what's the goal of war? As we said before, it's to get the other person to give up so completely that you they don't fight anymore. And it used to be the best way to do that was to beat someone over the head. But now there are many more subtle ways of doing it. What's the best way of getting a nation to stop fighting you? You just convince them they don't want to fight anymore. And there are many ways of doing that other than beating them. So here's an example. Um, you're a mob boss. Imagine there are three mob bosses in New York City. You're the third most powerful. You are the third strongest. You have the third best technology. You have the third most land. If you went head to head with either of these mob bosses in a mob war, you would get your ass kicked. What's the best way to win a mob war and take over the city? You make friends with them, but not them. You would make friends with them, but they're always going to treat you like the little brother. You can't kill them. They are way better than you are. And then uh, they are thugs that they are so, that they are better on your side instead of. Your You're not persuasive enough. <laughs> oh, you can't get them. They are all families. They are just larger families. Right. You have to find somebody who can infiltrate the the mob boss. Infiltrate? Like somebody that he would put his trust in, find his weakness. He's way too careful. <laughs> you aren't strong enough, but there's two other mob bosses. What happens oh, when a mob yeah. get them to fight each other? Why would you Hard exert your force if you could get them to... Because you know who's going to be the strongest one left standing if those two beat the crap out of each other? You. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that's another that's way smart, yeah. Yeah, Does you get the two off? people to fight each other. In the same way, why on earth would you necessarily want to, you don't have to invade another country, why not just get the two groups inside to fight each other? You can see the present example in the Middle East, the Yemen war, Syria, or, uh, Iraq, Iran, yeah. Saudi Arabia. What you know, better way of getting control over a space you want than help making sure both sides beat the crap out of each other so hard that you're left with whatever you want? Well, and then. Uh, yeah, just, just wanted to, uh, to confirm your uh, hypothesis. It's in the Gerasma doctrine, it's related directly to the NGO, because one way that it is applicable, that Russian government actually applies the doctrine, is in a way that they have asked the uh, foreign NGOs to register as a foreign agent. In that way, uh, let's see, who, who uh, was drawn from the, from the Russian Federation? I think it's National Endowment for Democracy and USA because they didn't want to register. Yeah, and so, the, and the thing is, is just the number of ways in which this is happening is beyond, and here's another way. If you are Russia or China or the United States, who are your biggest rivals for power and control? The other big nations. So the best way to make yourself stronger is to make them weaker, which means that you have reason to get involved and associated with things that, are going to weaken them or give you more control. So for instance, um, you might want to maybe not necessarily control or dictate things, but destabilize other nations. You might want to support resistance groups. You might want to make it the case so that within these nations there's not a single voice agreeing on these sorts of things. So the line between, like, Propaganda is now, and fake news, and these sorts of things. So one of the ways in which the Gerasimov Doctrine was applied, um, contrary to the president's claims, uh, one way in which 
it influenced things, was there were moves made by the Russian government not to actively meddle or change election results or anything like that in the United States, but to have an influence on the 2016 US election. And how was it done? What sorts of things were done? It's, they did not hack into the voting machines. They did not change the numbers. What was it? Social media influence the people. Yeah, social media influence. Because here's the thing. One way you can convince somebody not to go to war is you change their mind enough so that they don't want to fight you anymore. Or they get so mad at somebody else that they are so busy over there that they don't, they're not worried about other things. Or what used to be a strong nation is now so busy ripping itself apart that it's not worried about you. So um, what were the sorts of things involved? How was it that Facebook was exploited during the 2016 election by No, what is it? The uh, I in the what, what is the name of it? The um, I think it's the Internet IBM. Research. Anyway, uh, a bunch of hackers in in St. Petersburg. Yeah. What was done? So that was one thing. Was there was a hack to the Democratic uh, National um, Committee? But the more interesting one is what did they start doing? They started making Facebook groups. And these Facebook groups were being populated by fake Americans who would then post things on these Facebook groups that would say incredibly inflammatory things. And the goal was to get people in an area to think, oh my god, there are other people who think like me here. And so, for instance, how many of you saw the, the Trump rally in which there was a uh, Hiller, a woman dressed as Hillary Clinton in a cage, like she was in prison? She was paraded around like, lock her up, lock her up. Does anyone see this? It was an actress. She was paid for it. It was all above board. Does anyone know who she was paid by? She was paid out of Moscow. Here was another one. There was, a, there was a rally that happened in Texas between a group called the Heart of Texas, and they had a rally called Stop the Islamization of Texas. At the same time, a separate group called the, um, I can't remember the name, or something along the uh, like Islamic Culture Society or something along those lines decided to have a Save Islamic Knowledge rally in response to it. And if you went on the uh, Heart of Texas website, it's exactly what you'd imagine. A bunch of people with Confederate flags and guns and that sort of thing. And then there was this other one. And what ended up happening is they were called to the same day on the same street in which the two groups got on opposite sides and yelled and hurled insults and got mad at each other exactly like you'd expect. Um, what was the catch? Why is this noteworthy? Where was the person who started the Heart of Texas from? Anyone know? Where would you think he'd be from if you saw that Facebook group? Where would you think he was from? You'd think he's from Texas. It's called the heart of Texas. Uh, he was from Moscow. Uh, not only that, he started the other group too. They started them both, arranged them to meet at the same day at the same time, and arranged